All right, well, here we go. Uh, last time I made a very ambitious claim, and I want to expand on that claim. I won't fully justify it today, but at least we'll get started on that. And the claim is that in this line of business, in the Illocutionary Act line of business, uh, there aren't an infinite number of different things you can do. Uh, there are basically five and only five types of things that you can do. There are an infinite number of different propositional contents. Uh, there are no limit to what can be a propositional content, but there are a limit to the number of ways that mind and language can present this in the performance of the Speech Act. Uh, now, why is that a big deal? Why do we care? And the answer is uh, because this, so I'm arguing, is the fundamental unit of human linguistic communication. And that's not an accident, because every one of these, every pre presentation of a propositional content with an illocutionary force is an expression of one of these, where you have a psychological state in the sincerity condition with the same propositional content. So every one of these presents a proposition with a certain illocutionary force, but in so doing, the speaker expresses a sincerity condition, an intentional state, that has exactly the same propositional content and so the same conditions of satisfaction. Uh, now that's a deep point, and if we understand that fully, we ought to be able to understand some of the important connections between mind and language. You see, one crucial difference is that these guys on the top are all actions. Every one of these is a human act, whereas these are all states. And it turns out that an act of linguistic communication is necessarily an expression of the corresponding intentional state. And you'll see that's true if you go through it. Every statement is the expression of a belief. Every order is the expression of a desire. Every promise is the expression of an intention. Every uh, thanking is an expression of gratitude. Every congratulation is an expression of pleasure at the uh, good fortune of the person you're congratulating, and so on through all the other cases. Now what that suggests is something I'm going to develop later, and that is that we have to think of these as a development of the more biologically primary form, which are these. So beliefs and desires and intention and hopes and fears are biologically basic. Beasts that don't have a language still have beliefs and desires and intentions. Once you get a language, you can then give a public manifestation of these intentional states in a, in a public speech act that communicates to other people. So it looks like what I think is the case is that language is a later evolutionary development on pre-linguistic forms of a biologically more primary forms of intentionality. And that has to be right. I mean, beasts like us walked around on the surface of the earth and didn't talk to each other. And then, we don't know when, they started talking to each other. Now, uh, what exactly was added when they started talking to each other? What did they get when they had language? And I'm going to suggest they built something on top of uh, beliefs and desires and intentions that they already had, just as their beliefs and desires and intentions were themselves built on their capacity uh, to perceive and to perform intentional actions. So we need to show how language is a natural development of human biology. Now, those of you who've done the reading, and I, if you've done it, do it again, because it's hard stuff, um, will notice that there's a difference in approach between the article, What is Language?, and the book Speech Acts. In Speech Acts, I thought, the right way to think of language is it's like playing a game. You learn the rules of the game, 
and then you're able to make statements and make promises and ask questions and all the rest of it. And there's something right about that where full-blown human languages are concerned. But if you think of how language could have developed, then it seems to me you've got to start with stuff that's prior to games. So there's a certain irony. Uh, like Wittgenstein and Austin, I thought the right way to understand language was to see it as like, a, a rule, like engaging in rule-governed behavior as when you play a game like chess or baseball. But now it seems to me, no, you can't understand chess or baseball without language. You can have beasts that have language but don't have chess or baseball, but you can't have people have chess or baseball but don't have language. Language is prior to games. We're not going to understand language by overstretching the analogy with games. All the same, there is something rule-governed about language, and the rules are constitutive and not just regulate. They don't just regulate antecedently existing forms of behavior, but they actually constitute the forms of behavior. So there's a complex set of relations between the pre-linguistic intentionality, the development of linguistic meaning, and then once you've got linguistic meaning, you can do all kinds of things that pre-linguistic animals can't do. See, I can think uh, if uh, Barack Obama had not had so much difficulties with the health care legislation and with the current economic situation. His chances of the Democrats maintaining control of Congress in the fall elections would have been much greater than they are now. Uh, now that's a thought that just occurred to me. I don't know if it's true or false, but the point is uh, my dog Gilbert can't think that thought. He's a pretty smart doggy, but he just can't do that one. Uh, why not? Well, the answer is to do that one, you've got to have a whole lot of apparatus that he doesn't have. He, you've got to have a linguistic apparatus that he hasn't got. Um, all right, so we're now, we're now we, we haven't fully got to that point yet. I'm going to get there, but the point we're at now is that we're suggesting, or I'm suggesting, that in the Illocutionary Act line of business, there are five and only five kinds of things you can do. And I didn't quite finish the exposition of that, so I'm going to go through these rapidly and then pick up on these last two, on the uh, fourth and the fifth, because I didn't say much about them last time. Okay. Remember, the question is always, what is the point of a speech act in virtue of being a speech act of that type. Uh, I might make an assertion because uh, uh, I've been asked to do it, or this seems the polite thing to do, or it's expected of me. But whenever I make an assertion, I commit myself to the truth of the expressed proposition. I present that proposition as representing how things are in reality. That's the illocutionary point, and we represent that with this gate symbol that we owe to Frege. Uh, uh, Frege invented what he called the assertion sign to mark the fact that it's an assertion. The direction of fit of assertions is always word to world, and indeed the simplest test for the presence of that direction of fit is can you literally characterize the speech act as true or false? That's the mark of truth and falsity. Is, uh, uh, the mark of, of uh, truth and falsity is the existence of that direction of fit. Okay, the propositional content of assertives is not restricted by the illocutionary point. Uh, so, for example, some verbs will restrict the propositional content. If I predict something, then it has to be about the future, uh, or it can't, at least it can't be something that's known, already known about uh, the past. So there are restrictions on propositional content that are uh, placed by variations on this illocutionary point. But the point as such, the fact of uh, presenting something as representing how things are as such doesn't restrict what sorts of things you can represent. Okay, I think that one's fairly easy. And the examples of assertives are fairly obvious. There are things like state and assert, describe, classify, clarify, and explain. 
Now, immediately notice several complexities, however. One is, often a verb will mark a bunch of speech acts. Take explaining. Typically, if you explain something, you have to give more than one assertive. If I explain to you uh, the operation of the modern digital computer or the internal combustion engine, it's going to take a whole lot of statements, assertions, descriptions, and they add up to a single big speech act, the explanation. So a speech act can contain a whole lot of subsidiary speech acts. An explanation or a description may contain a whole lot of subsidiary assertions and <coughs> statements. Furthermore, notice some tricky features. In popular speech, we tend to contrast asserting and denying, as if denying were a different type of speech act, but it's not. Uh, asserting is like this, and denying is like this. You put a not in front of the propositional content. A denial is the assertion of a negation. It's not a separate type of speech act. And that's shown by the fact that the same rules come into play. You have to be able to answer the question, well, how do you know that it's not the case, and so on, uh, whenever you deny something. So we're to think of the uh, assertion and denial as not two different types of speech act, but denial as just a special subclass of assertions. Frege was aware of that. He, he saw that point. All right, so you've got all of these assertives. Now notice another crucial point. Not all illocutionary verbs mark different kinds of illocutionary acts because not all verbs mark distinct illocutionary points. So if you take an example I gave last time, an announcement, any one of these could be announced. And a university bulletin board that says announcements could contain directives, assertives, expressives, declarations. It could contain any of these illocutionary points. Announcing specifies the type in which the, the manner in which the illocutionary act is presented. An announcement is typically to the general public, unlike, say, confiding in somebody or saying something confidentially. And sometimes you get an illocutionary verb that marks more than one illocutionary uh, point. Uh, think of uh, insist and suggest. Insisting and suggesting can be either assertives or directives. Um, I can insist that the answer is found on page 160 of Quine's mathematical logic, or I can suggest that you go and, and look somewhere. Now notice there that the insist and suggest uh, take uh, different uh, verb forms. The insisting as is characteristic, insisting where it's a directive as is characteristic of directives uh, will uh, take the infinitive as when, uh, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry, suggesting, uh, will take the, and suggesting, uh, and when I suggest to you to go, whereas when I suggest that such and such is the case, it will be in the form of an assertive. So insist and suggest are, don't mark types of illocutionary points. They mark the degree of intensity with which an illocutionary point is presented. Insisting is presenting it with some urgency, with some firmness. Suggesting is just putting it forward as a possibility. So you don't get a perfect match between the verbs and the types of speech act, and that's a mistake uh, in Austin. Austin thought if you had different illocutionary verbs with different meanings, they must mark different, times of speech, different types of speech act, but that's not necessarily the case. Okay, so I think assertives are fairly clear, but we get some complexities when you get to assertives that have a declarational point, what I call assertive declarations, and I'll come to those in a moment. Okay, the next class is directives, and those are where the illocutionary point is the speaker's trying to get the hearer to do something. And the, the verbs that name those are the obvious ones, things like uh, order, command, request, and then suggest in this sense where we use it as a directive. Uh, and I, I beg and plead are often examples as well. Uh, and I said last time that prayer 
when you're actually praying is typically not a directive, but it's an expressive. You're expressing uh, your desire or your hope or your fear or your worship or whatever. All right, now I'll, I'll go through commissives and then we'll take questions because I'm going to spend a little more time on the last two. Uh, commissives have the illocutionary point that they commit the speaker to a future course of action. And it has to be, I didn't write this out, but it has to be a future voluntary action. It isn't just any old action, but something in the future that's voluntary. And consequently, uh, they have the upward or world-to-word -word direction of fit, and every commissive is the expression of an intention. The sincerity condition on a promise is that you intend to do the thing you promise to do. So the philosopher's favorite commissive is always promising, but you get lots of others as well, such as um, a, a threatening, a contracting, guaranteeing, warranting, pledging, all of those will be cases of commissive, where you commit yourself, where the speaker commits himself or herself to some future course of action. Now notice that the propositional content of the commissive is always that the speaker does a future voluntary action. The propositional content of the directive is that the hearer does some future voluntary action. But they both have the same direction of fit. They're both trying to get reality to change to match the words rather than to get the words to match an independently existing reality. Now you might think, well look, if they both got the same direction of fit, why can't we treat them as really uh, the same type of speech act? And people have suggested this to me. Why not treat uh, promising as a kind of an order that you give to yourself? Uh, why not treat orders as a kind of promise that you impose on the hearer? And there is a deep reason why that doesn't work. And the deep reason is that in the case of promising, you impose an obligation on yourself. Uh, you create, you don't just uh, give an order to yourself, but you create an obligation that wasn't there before. But in that way, you can't do that on the hearer. Uh, I can't impose an obligation on you just by telling you to do something. I can do that if it's part of an institutional structure. If I'm the commanding officer and you're a soldier in the army, then within that structure I can impose obligations on you. But if I just walk up to somebody on the street and say, take your clothes off or give me your shirt, uh, there's no obligation, uh, whatever there. Uh, whereas if I make a promise to you, even a stupid promise, all the same, I can undertake an obligation. Now again, this is a very deep point having to do with the nature of commitment. And the glue that holds human society together, we'll get to that in a minute, is commitment. People commit themselves in various ways. And the commissive commits you as such in a way that the directive does not commit the um, hearer. So the reason you can't assimilate commissives and directives to the same is that the directive does not commit the hearer in a way that the commissive commits the speaker. You get a, a serious asymmetry between what you can do in those two cases. All right, now I'm going to go on and discuss these much messier uh, cases, expressives, and then I'm going to talk about declarations. Where this, we, didn't get, we really didn't finish talking about declarations last time. Now, expressives are kind of a mess, but the whole point of the expressive is to express the sincerity condition. And that's why uh, you have to put the S in brackets here. The state express can vary. It's a variable. Uh, whenever I put brackets, that means there's a variable. Different things can go in there. So the illocutionary point of the expressive is just to express the sincerity condition. Typically, not always, the truth of the propositional content is presupposed. So it's not either the downhill nor the uphill direction of fit. If I say, I apologize for stepping on your foot, then I take it for granted that I stepped on your foot. Uh, I'm not trying to get your foot stepped on. That would be a directive or a commissive. And I'm not trying to claim that I stepped on your foot. That would be an assertive 
but I'm literally presupposing or taking for granted that I stepped on your foot when I say I apologize for stepping on your foot. Now, you can uh, lie to people by apologizing for things that you know you didn't do, thus pretending that you had done it. You can deceive people by presenting something as presupposed as true when you know it isn't true. But all the same, the illocutionary point is not to make an assertion when you give an expressive. So typical verbs that name expressives are apologize, thank, congratulate, welcome, and condole. In all of those cases, you presuppose the truth of the propositional content. Thanks for giving me the money. I apologize for stepping on your foot. Congratulations on winning the race. In, any one, in every one of those, you presuppose the truth of the propositional content. And in English, but not in other language, that's marked by this gerundive form. For stepping on your foot. Uh, for giving me the money. The for verb ing form is a typical of cases where you presuppose the truth of the proposition. And I may have told you, but if I didn't, I'll tell you now. I had a, when I first studied French, I had a French instructor who was always late. And he would say, excuse me, to be late. And that's good French, but it's bad English. In English, you have to say, excuse me for being late. In French, you can say, excusez-moi d'être en retard. Uh, because I, they, not, they don't use this gerundive form. But in English, you have to say, excuse me, for being late, uh, not uh, uh, to be late. I mean, it's not the end of the world if he, we all understood him. But the point is, it's a subtle difference. And often, the illocutionary point is marked by such subtle differences. Okay, now how about, though, the illocutionary act of expressing a psychological state where the psychological state does have a direction of fit and it's not presupposed. Are those expressives? And I think they are, yeah. I think there can be cases where you express a desire so intensely uh, that the whole thing is expressive, but all the same it has a direction of fit because the desire has a direction of fit. Or a belief, you express the belief. I firmly believe that the Democrats provide the only hope, or whatever, you imagine uh, political speakers. And there the whole point is to express the belief, and I think that's true of prayers as well. So you do get cases of expressives where the point is to express the state, uh, but all the same, it does have a direction of fit, uh, either downhill in the case of belief, or uphill in the case of desires. I want you to do this for me, Henry. I want you to do it for me and Cynthia and all the children. Uh, I say that to some, or somebody uh, 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 is, uh, who's married to Cynthia says that, and he says it as a way of expressing his firm desire. Now, of course, that's likely also to be an indirect speech act. That is, he performs the expressive by way of performing a directive. And you're going to see when we get to the complexities that often... You can do one of these by performing another. And in general, you can perform any speech act by, indirectly by stating that you have the corresponding sincerity condition. You can tell somebody to do something by telling them you want to do it. You can make a statement by stating that you have a belief. I, you say to me, uh, uh, when was Descartes born? And I say, well... I think it was about um, 1596. I believe it was 1596. And you might say, you wouldn't say to me, well, don't change the subject. I ask you about his birthday and you tell me about your state of mind. You know, you tell me about your Cartesian state of your soul. Uh, No, I am answering the question when I say, I believe Descartes was born in 1596. I'm not just talking about my state of mind. That's an indirect speech act. It is a hesitant assertion made by way of stating that I have a belief. So you can perform just about any one of these by stating that you have the corresponding psychological state. You can uh, um, apologize by saying I'm sorry. You can congratulate somebody by saying I'm glad. You can thank somebody by saying I'm grateful and so on. 
All right, so the expressives are a complicated family of cases, but I think the basic idea is clear. The basic idea is that sometimes the primary point of the speech act is just to express a sincerity condition. That's when you thank somebody or congratulate somebody. Now we get to declarations, and I don't much care if you call them declaratives or declarations. I, when I first published this, I call them declarations because I wanted to mark the fact that they're kind of special, that they really are different from the others, and I'm going to spend a few minutes on them, so let's stop for questions. I've actually, I said an awful lot in these few minutes, but much of it, some of it I said last time, so um, I, I don't, I think it's all right to go through it fast, but let's stop for questions. I want everybody to understand this. Yes. Yeah, that is all the question. If I say somebody said, do you know where the story is? Is that a directive? Now, to begin with, all questions are directives. They're directives to give an answer. But that particular directive, do you know where the story is, will typically be taken not as a question about your epistemic state, but a question asking for directions. So it's equivalent to, I'm asking you, do you know where the store is? And I'm doing that way by asking you to tell me how to get to the store. So it's really two questions. Uh, do you know, uh, which is the presupposition of tell me uh, the way, and, so, and if so, please tell me the way. That's how it works. And there are these uh, jokes. Uh, Inspector Cluzo is stopped on the streets of Geneva. Do you know the way to the Palace Hotel? And he thinks for a minute and says, yes and marches on, you know, so I, I think, he, well, he's answered the question, but of course the, the questioner wanted to get directions and not just a statement about his epistemic state. Now you have to distinguish genuine questions from exam question. In a genuine question, uh, the, the person asking the question is ignorant about uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, state of affairs that is being asked about. But in an exam question, you can't say, if it's an oral exam and they ask you a question, you can't say to the examiners, ah, oh, you guys know the answer to that. Don't ask me that. You know that already. Uh, because, of course, they're not interested uh, in getting the information. What they want to find out is, do you have the information? So uh, there, there are complexities to the notion of qu questions. And, a, and a, a genuine question seeks information, but a, a genuine question can also... Uh, uh, be an indirect speech act. Do you have to make so damn much noise when I'm trying to study? Doesn't invite, yeah, I guess I do have to make so damn much noise. It invites, please, it, it invites the interpretation, please stop making so much noise. Now, the rhetorical question is, I think, not a genuine question, though I'm open to discussion about that, because the rhetorical question doesn't invite an answer. Uh, now, it's true, often the audience will, do we want four more years of a Republican administration? They, they say this at the, at the National Convention, and they don't expect everybody to think about, well, I don't know, do we or don't we? No, they, that's a rhetorical question. They, uh, uh, the, uh, the rhetorical question is a way of making an assertion. Now, the argument that, well, all the same is, it, a, it is a kind of question, is that the, the literal response is always appropriate. So the audience shouts, no, no more four more years of Republican administration or whatever uh, is the appropriate thing. So rhetorical questions are an interesting case because they're always a case where there's something defective about the question. The speaker uh, is not seeking an answer except, ironically, except indirectly. Uh, what the speaker's trying to do is make a claim based on the rhetorical question. Okay, so you understand that. It's quite complicated, but the basic idea is this. Often you perform an indirect speech act by way of asking a question. Now, the question is still literally asked, so, and that's shown by the fact that you can always give an answer to the literal. Do you know the way to the Palace Hotel? Yes, I do. Here's how you get there. Yes. So, there's, so is there much of a difference between where is the store and tell me where the no, there isn't, and that I, that's a, I, let me repeat that, that's a very deep point. There's not much difference between where's the store and please tell me where the store is, and what does that tell you? What that tells you is that every question is a directive. What's the name of the first president of the United States? Tell me the name of the first president of the United States. Those are pretty much the same speech act, because a, every question is a directive and one argument for that is that you can always 
perform the question by putting it in the form of the directive, tell me. How many people were at the party? Tell me how many people were at the party. You, we hear those as pretty much the same. Now, with questions, however, you don't get a whole propositional content. I, you, you get a propositional content, yes or no. That is, and I'm sorry, I said you don't get a whole propositional content. You don't get the presentation of a propositional content with an illocutionary force. Here, the question is, P, yes or no, if it's a, a yes, no question. And the so-called WH question, the who, what, where, when, how questions, and we call those WH because we think all of those um, interrogative pronouns have a wh at the beginning. Now, they don't all, uh, how doesn't, but in any case, they're all supposed to have a wh sound. Uh, uh, those are all propositional uh, uh, functions in that you don't get a complete proposition. So the question is, X number of people were there, and then the force of the question is fill in the value of X. I say, how many people were there? They're supposed to fill in the value of X. 37 people were there. And if the question is a Y question, then it is P because of X, and you're supposed to fill in the value of X. That is, uh, why did the Republicans win the last election? Asked you to fill in uh, the uh, form. Uh, the Republicans lost the last election because. So the where, who, what, where, when, why, how questions all ask you to fill in the value of a variable in the, pro in the incomplete proposition. The proposition that you're presented with is not complete. Only in yes-no questions is it complete. Questions are a fascinating uh, uh, field of investigation for precisely these kind of reasons. Uh, okay, any other questions at this point? Yes. Yes. Now, the question is, can you make an assertive and a directive in the same speech act? Uh, and the answer is obviously yes. Uh, sir, you're standing on my foot. That's an assertion. No, I'm not standing on your foot. It's your dog that's standing on your foot. I, I might say, uh, thus saying the assertion is false. But if you do say, sir, you're standing on my foot, I can't say, how interesting. <laughs> Uh, because the point, typically, is um, to get you to get off my foot. So that, uh, sir, you're standing on my foot, is an assertion that is performed by way of indirectly performing a directive. It's what I call an indirect speech act, and those are very common. Uh, you're making too much noise, I can't study, um, and, and so on. There are lots of cases like that where you make an assertion uh, the purpose of which is to uh, give somebody, get somebody to do something uh, about it. And we're all familiar with those. And uh, sometimes uh, people ask questions uh, where uh, they seek permission, and it looks like the only polite thing to do is to give them permission. So you're thinking of telling the woman in front of you, um, I, I can't actually see the stage when you have on that huge hat. That would be an indirect speech act, asking her to take the hat off. But if she turns to you first and says, do you mind if I leave my hat on? Then it's pretty tough. And I've found uh, from bitter experience, the only way is Trump in the same suit say, do you mind taking it off? You see that? If she says, I, I, do you mind if I leave my hat on? It's a bit rude to say, I can't see the damn stage when you got your damn hat on. I mean, that's a bit harsh. But if you trump in the same suit, would you mind taking it off? It turns out you're just as polite as she is, though neither of you is really being polite. A civilization works on people giving the appearance of politeness even when they're being rude. Uh, I used to be said in my childhood that the mark of an English gentleman is that he's only rude on purpose. He's never rude inadvertently or unintentionally. Okay, any other questions about questions or anything else? Yeah.
Yes, suggesting differs from insisting, not in a definite illocutionary point, because it can be either an assertive or a directive. It maybe even could be a, a commissive. I insist that I'm going to do this for you, Sally. Could be a very special kind of promise, a, a firm promise. Yes. Yes. The, the idea is this. If you present two elocutionary points, two or more, you're performing multiple speech acts. But many verbs don't just mark the elocutionary point, but they mark some other feature, such as how intensely the point is presented. So uh, I insist that you leave the room. It does, isn't two speech acts directing and insisting, but it is directing in an insistent fashion. Do you see that? Whereas the cases we considered, uh, I can't stand it having you here in the room. That would be uh, two speech acts. I'd be making a statement, and then uh, by, by way of making the statement, I indirectly issue an order to you to leave the room. Do you see that? So the mark of whether, uh, when you have multiple speech acts, is uh, uh, do you have different illocutionary points? Now the question is, how many can you have? And it seems to me you can get an awful lot in one speech act. I gave you the example of the wife who says to her husband, it's 2 a.m., and she says, it's really quite late. They're at a party, it's, and he's behaving drunkenly. Uh, he says, it's really, she says, it's really quite late. That's an assertive. But it's also the expression of a desire. I want to go now. It may even be a commissive, a threat. Wait till I get you home. It could even be an expressive, I'm really fed up with your bad behavior. It could be all of those things in a single speech act. And I, 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 the mark of, of uh, conflict often is that people perform, people say things indirectly. They're reluctant. Uh, to come out and state the naked conflict so they dress it up. Uh, it would be awfully helpful to you, if, uh, to us, if you could do such and such, meaning we can't stand your present form of behavior, do something different. Okay, other, all of these are good questions. Any other questions? Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm not hearing you. Let me come around. If I just ask you a straight question, what time is it? Uh, that's just a question. That's not an extra. Right, when you say commit, can you commit to being at work on Friday? Uh, every, uh, every speech act is some kind of a commitment. Right. The, the, the mark of the commissive is that co you commit yourself to bringing about the truth of the propositional content. So if I say, um, I, 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 you, you will have the day off on Friday, then I, com I mean, that'll be an assertive made by way of a commitment because I'm committing you, I'm committing myself to giving you the day off on Friday if I'm the boss and you're an employee. Okay, other questions at this point? Well, let's, yes. I had a question. In, in the speech act book, it comes when you say that there should be, like if I say, Murray for Berkeley or Lee yeah. for some sort of acquisition object. That's right. Object. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's an expressive. There are speech acts where you just have an N and no, not a whole proposition. And uh, uh, th those are typically expressives. Go Bears, hurrah for Cal, uh, down with whoever. Uh, all of those are expressives with, with just a reference. And as you know, there are a lot of expressives where there's no explicit propositional content. Most of the English expletives, I won't repeat them for you now, but the usual obscenitives uh, said uh, by way of expressing frustration, irritation, exasperation, uh, do not uh, necessarily have any propositional content. Oh, damn. Uh, people say. Now, you may know what the propositional content is, but there needn't be any that's actually expressed in the expressive speech act. It can just be F, like that. Uh, and maybe, well, the exclamation point doesn't, here isn't being used to mark a directive. Uh, okay, 
So let's now look at this messy category of declarations. Now there is a remarkable capacity that human languages have to create a reality by representing it as existing. The chairman of the meeting says the meeting is adjourned. Uh, Congress says war is hereby declared. And we also have a capacity to make these declarations with performatives. Remember I told you there's a distinction between the performative verb, the performative sentence, and the performative utterance. So when you say to somebody, I promise to come and see you on Wednesday, you make it the case that you promise, but how do you do it? You do it by saying that you promise, but saying that you promise in a situation where it's clearly not just a statement to the effect that you promise, but it is the making of a promise. So it seems to me in the case of the performative saying, I promise to come and see you, that is a declaration that makes it the case that I promise by representing myself as promising, by stating that I promise. Now there was, used to be a huge debate uh, between Austin and his opponents. Austin said, the performative is not a statement. If I say I order you to leave the room or I promise to come and see you, I'm not stating anything. I'm ordering or promising. And his opponents said, no, those are all statements. Promise, if I say I promise, then I'm not just promising, but I'm stating that I promise. And I'm not just ordering if I say I order you to leave the room, but I'm stating that I'm ordering. Now I wanna say, in a way, both parties are right. Austin was right to see that the primary illocutionary point of the performative is not to make the statement. But all the same, the way you do it, the way you make the promise, give the order, make the apology, is by saying that you promise or state or apologize I, and, or order or apologize. And in those cases, the utterance is both, if I say, I promise to come and see you on Wednesday, then I'm, I have made a promise. That's the primary elocutionary point. That's the whole point of doing this exercise is to make a promise. But how did I do it? I did it by stating. And how is it that I can do it by stating? Well, the whole thing is a declaration. And how does the declaration work? It works this way. You make something the case, you make it the case that you promise, and thus you achieve the world-to-word -word direction of fit. You change reality to match the words. You change reality so that a promise has now been made. Similarly, when you adjourn the meeting or declare war, you I change reality so that war now exists or a, a meeting is now adjourned. But you change reality by representing it as being changed. You make it the case that the propositional content is true by representing it as being true. Uh, you make it the case that there is a promise by representing it as being a case that there is a promise. You make it the case that there's an order by representing it as being the case that there is an order. So in fact, these performatives, uh, cases where I say I, may, I make a promise by saying I promise to come and see you, or I make an order by saying I order you to leave the room, there are three different speech acts in one utterance. There's the primary illocutionary point of the promise when I say I promise to come and see you. But I did it by way of making an assertive, by making an assertion, and that adds up to a declaration. I made it the case by declaration that I promised. So the prom if I make a promise by saying I promise, I have said something true, as in uh, uh, any satisfactory assertive. But this is the key point. What makes it true is my saying it. That is, my saying it makes it the case that a promise is made simply by representing myself as making a promise. Now that is, uh, that's a mouthful, and if you don't understand that yet, don't worry about it, because we're going to say more about that. Uh, to put it in the most uh, modest terms I can think of, that is the key to understanding human civilization. 
we create a reality by representing it as existing. And that is the, the speech acts that do that all have the logical form of declarations. Typically, they're not explicit declarations. So you are a student in this university. I'm a professor. You're a citizen of the United States. Barack Obama is president. I, have, uh, I own a, a car. Uh, I have a large dog named Gilbert. All of those facts are created by representing them as existing. And uh, we're blinded to this by the fact that the syntax looks just like ordinary descriptive syntax. So I say, uh, this is, uh, I just got back from Europe, but uh, here, this is an American, uh, this American currency. I, I, this is American money. What fact about it makes it money? It's not a fact about the piece of paper. You can't find it out that it's money by doing a careful study of the chemistry. Well, what fact makes it money? The fact that makes it money, to put it very crudely, is we all think it's money. We all accept it as money. Now, that fact doesn't exist by itself. It has to be issued by the Bureau of Engraving and Printing under the authority of the Treasury. If I get a very neat machine at home where I can manufacture these in my basement, I will get in trouble. So there, it, isn't, it, it isn't out of the blue that we accept it as money. It has to be authorized in a certain way. But this is the key point. The fact that it's money is created by declaration. It's created by representations. They needn't be explicit speech acts that have the same form as a declaration where you make something the case by representing it as being the case. And if you get that going and you keep it going, then you have created a certain type of power. And that power is what marks human civilization from other sorts of animal communities. As I say, Gilbert and his doggy friends have a nice doggy life and they even cooperate with each other in doggy intentionality. They run around together uh, in the yard and, and play with uh, chasing each other's tail and so on. So they do have cooperation and collective intentionality. But they don't have income tax, uh, universities, um, uh, degrees, summer vacations, uh, or um, uh, uh, cocktail parties, just to mention a few trivial examples of facts that are created by declaration. So the declaration is not a sort of an innocent little side effect uh, to uh, the use of language. I, later on, I'm not ready to argue this, but later on I'll argue. Uh, that's how we create and maintain human civilization. We get, the, get control of the vocabulary, and you can control the power. Uh, revolutionaries understand that. Revolutionaries understand you must change the vocabulary. In Russia, they wanted people to call each other comrade and not use the traditional forms of express. And the feminists were anxious to get rid of ladies and gentlemen because those marked a certain type of status that they wanted to alter. Okay, I, I'm not going to lecture about this this morning, but I wanna, I'll take questions in a second. I want to call your attention, though, to the fact that the Declaration is the device by which we create institutional reality, the reality of money and property and government and marriage and universities and lawyers and doctors and licensed drivers and cocktail parties and so on. All of those are created by representing them as existing. And the logical form of that representation is it's a declaration. Now, not all declarations are like that. As I said last time, when God says, let there be light, that's a declaration. That makes it the case by declaration that light exists. We can't do that. We, can, um, uh, we cannot create light by saying, let there be light. But we can create all kinds of other things. Let the meeting be adjourned. Let this utterance be a, a promise. Uh, let it be the case that you've been ordered to leave the room. All of those are declarations. And they make some in the case by representing it as being the case. OK, questions about all that. You first, and then you. Yeah. So if you say this is money is a declaration, aren't all assertions then declarations? No. Now, this is the crucial point. Uh, if I take out a piece of paper and say this is money, uh, I, it's not going to work as money unless I have an awful lot of clout. 
But when these guys say, and I'm and keep your eye out for speech acts that nobody's paying any attention to, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. That is not a truth that is epistemically based on empirical investigation. The Treasury did not do a serious investigation. They say, yeah, you know, we looked at a lot of these, and, and they really are legal tender for all debts by and private. I mean, you know, maybe there are a couple in Kansas City that aren't, but the ones that we've been able to find, certainly even Oakland is full of things that are uh, legal tender. So it's true. <laughs> That's not the force of this. The force of this is to make something the case by representing it as being the case. They didn't do a study and find that this was legal tender. They make it legal tender by declaring it to be legal tender. I can't do that. Now the question is, how the hell do people get away with this? Uh, and the answer is, you can get away with it if you get people to accept it. And you might think, yeah, but that's, you gotta have some kind of authority to get them to accept it. Well, sometimes you do, but think of those guys in Philadelphia. There is no uh, rule of British Constitution that enables a bunch of private subjects, they're not even citizens, they're subjects of the crown, in, a, in the city of Philadelphia in 1776, a group of middle-aged men got together and said, we uh, declare ourselves to be a separate country. And they use the vocabulary of declaration. It's called the Declaration of Independence. Now, how did they get away with it? Well, the answer is they got people to accept it. Now, if we got together here after the class and said, let's declare ourselves to be a separate country uh, of central Berkeley, uh, it isn't going to work because we won't get people to accept it. But they got people to accept it. Now, they needed help. Uh, they had to defeat the British armies. And also they have um, uh, something a, a lot of Americans would rather forget. Uh, they couldn't have done it without help from the French. Uh, I mean, the French had their own uh, uh, fish to fry. They had their own axe to grind to mix the metaphor. But all the same, we would not have won the Revolutionary War uh, without uh, outside help. And we did get outside help. And nobody realized how important it was at the time. So a bunch of guys in Philadelphia got together and made a declaration. And it worked. Now. Uh, uh, four score years later, uh, to paraphrase Abraham Lincoln, uh, a bunch of guys in Richmond, Virginia, tried to do the same thing to get uh, themselves a separate country. The Confederate States of America, distinct from the United States, but their declaration did not uh, come off because they didn't have the clout to support it. So it helps to have a system of clout, but not, remember, the armies themselves are created by declaration. The armies themselves are forms of collective intentionality. Now, I haven't told you all uh, about this. We don't have the tools yet to tell you all about it, but I want you to understand that the distinctive features, that what we think of as the distinctive features that mark human civilization as different from animal social life require representation. And the logical form of the representation by which we create and maintain money, private properties, universities, marriage, government, all of those require declarations, and these declarations create a type of institutional reality. Okay, a whole lot of hands were up. You're next. Okay, he gets a, he gets a footnote. Yes. So, um, but like, even if you were to say, like, the Confederate Republic or Pi B or whatever, yeah. um, that's, a that's an assertion, but it's also a declaration based on, you know... The no, it's, it's a statement of fact. You see, um, um, uh, if I say uh, C equals pi D, I don't know why I feel it necessary to write this out, but anyway, <laughs> uh, C equals pi D, uh, then I am not making it the case that C equals pi D. I'm reporting a fact, and I can be right or wrong about it. But if I say the class is adjourned, that is make something the case by representing as being the case. I can get this wrong. See, I can just be wrong. If I say uh, C equals one half pi d, then that's just a misreport. The definition of those terms are based on our. Ah, that's different. Now, watch this. The definition of the terms is indeed a matter of arbitrary uh, selection. So if I say uh, this stuff is called chalk, we're going to call this chalk, then the introduction of the term, the introduction of the term as having that meaning, that can be a declaration. From now on, the word will have that meaning. But once the word is introduced, it's a matter of fact that this is a piece of chalk. It's not a matter of declaration. 
You had your hand up, and you've been very patient. Yeah. I have a quick question. Um, you said that a permissive and an assertive can be part of a declaration. Yeah. Can expressive also be? Yes. Okay. Yeah. If I apologize by saying I apologize, then I have made it the case that I apologize and thus express sorrow or regret, but I've done it by declaring myself as apologizing. Well, similarly, if I order you to leave the room by saying you are ordered to leave the room or I hereby order you to leave the room, then I have, one, ordered you to leave the room, two, declared that I ordered you to leave the room, and three, said that I ordered you to leave the room. The, the important thing to see, though, is that the truth of the statement derives from the success of the declaration and not conversely. It's true that I ordered only because... I did succeed in issuing an order. Yes. So one through four can all be declarative. Yes, they can all be declarations. Now there's an interesting point that I put at the bottom here. There are institutional structures where people have to issue an assertive that has the force of the declaration. When the umpire shouts out as I come sliding into second base, that is, first of all, an assertive. He can get it right or wrong. But the assertive has the force of a declaration because if he calls me out at second base and he's upheld on appeal, then I am out. Do you see that? The umpire creates facts, but he does that by making an assertion that has the force of a declaration. Now, similarly with the judge and jury, if the judge says, I find the defendant guilty as charged, then for legal purposes, the defendant is guilty. But of course, that makes a claim of fact. It claims that the guy actually did it. So we have a special class of assertions made within an institutional structure where the assertion has the force of a declaration. Why? Well, roughly speaking, because it's not like philosophy where debate can go on forever. We've got to bring the discussion to an end. You find the guy out or you find him safe. You find the defendant guilty or you define the defendant uh, innocent and not guilty. So in those cases, you make an assertive that has the force of a declaration. So I say it's, an, it's a declaration, but it's also an assertion. It has the double direction of fit, but it also has the downhill direction of fit. And the proof of that is... Uh, judges and juries uh, can make mistakes, or they can be bribed, or they can lie, uh, and similarly with umpires, but all the same, once they have made the judgment, once the umpire, as they say, has made the call, if he's upheld on appeal, once the judge has made the verdict, and if he's held up on appeal, then it now has, the, as they say, the force of law. You have created a fact. Uh, there's a story told about the great uh, umpire Bill Clem, and there are three umpires are arguing, and one umpire says, I calls them the way I sees them. And the second umpire says, yeah, well, I calls them the way they really is. And Clem said, they ain't nothing till I calls them. Now, what he meant is he creates uh, what's the baseball facts. He creates somebody's being safe or being out. He creates the fact that it's a ball or a strike by calling it as a ball or a strike. He is emphasizing this part, the declarational part of the assertive declaration. The first guy was saying, I'm utterly sincere. I calls them as I see them. The second guy says, I'm making a true, I'm accurate. I calls them the way they really is. Clem says, they ain't nothing till I calls them, meaning there is no fact as to whether or not the guy was safe or not safe, whether or not he was uh, guilty. Uh, whether or not uh, it was a ball or a strike until I calls them. Uh, okay, now I want, uh, now this is the basic structure then, and the declarations are interesting because it, how do we get this remarkable capacity? Well, for human beings, it mostly comes from institutions. Uh, I, I, I can adjourn the meeting or pronounce somebody husband and wife or declare war only because of an institution. Sometimes, however, you can create an institutional fact by declaration just by getting people to accept it. Now, the uh, an interesting case for study are the supernatural declarations. I said, when God says, let there be light, uh, that is a case of making light by declaration. Uh, and I get in a lot of trouble by treating things 
as institutional that people tell me are not institutional. I've lectured on these subjects in Italy, uh, and people sometimes tell me, please don't use marriage as an example of a fact that is created by declaration, because only God can create uh, marriage. Well, okay, I leave that to God and the Italians. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but the fact is, if people continue to treat it as a marriage, even though it did not have the sanction from up above, then it functions socially as a marriage. We're now having, uh, as uh, you all know, a debate about whether or not uh, this same institutional fact uh, should be able to exist between people of the same sex. And it raises a lot of interesting uh, moral questions. Roughly speaking, I think most of us feel that, well, if people want to do it uh, and they're not hurting anybody, then why not? The difficulty is how far do you want to go? If it isn't just two guys or two girls, but it's, uh, let's say, two guys and uh, three girls all want to get married, uh, should that be allowed? Uh, well, and then it, you get all sorts of other uh, interesting complexities, like whose pension rights are there, uh, or if it's one guy and seven girls. Well, anyway, I, I won't go into all of the possibilities, all of the mathematical permutations. A good place to look for declarations is any supernatural context, and fairy stories are full of declarations. Uh, one of my favorites is in <coughs> uh, The Lord of the Rings, uh, there, you, I'm sure you all remember this. Uh, there was a famous battle, uh, the Battle of Khazad-dum, where Gandalf fights the Balrog. I won't write all that on the blackboard. You won't be here. <laughs> I'm probably sure. I'm not sure I can spell it. Gandalf fights the Balrog. Now he says, "There's a bridge, the bridge of Khazad-dum." He says to the Balrog, "You cannot pass." And you know that's false. The Balrog's got more. Uh, power. Uh, he's much stronger than Gandalf. But he, it isn't a prediction or a statement of fact. It's a declaration. Gandalf is summoning his magical powers to make it the case that the Balrog cannot pass. And it works. Uh, the Balrog is unable to pass. Now, unfortunately, it kills Gandalf. That was too much. It, uh, that declaration just, so to speak, exhausted his magical powers. However, uh, this is a, a fairy story, remember? So he comes back to life in a later volume. Yeah, as you re all remember, I'm sure, Gandalf comes back to, to life uh, and is restored even though he died and the, while performing this declaration at the Bridge of Khazad-dum. So fairy stories are full of declarations. And there is a kind of magical quality to the declaration. Uh, and it seems to work best if people aren't aware of it. I mean, if they... Uh, if they're not aware of the fact, look, it's only money because we think it's money. And he's only president because we think he is president. And all these other facts like marriage and money and private property and government and universities, they are what they are only because we think that's what they are. And the form of the thinking is a declaration. You represent, you create something by representing it. Yes. Well, a declaration made by a wizard is only going to work if he's got wizardly powers. That's the point I'm making. You see, we can get away with this because, one, we have institutional structures. I, can, I, I sell my car because I have a legal right to it. It's, it's my property. But that, uh, the fact that it's my property is created by declaration. It's a, a status, what I call a status function. But I, we do have, in imagination at least, uh, the uh, capacity uh, to assign these powers uh, to people outside of institutional structures. And sometimes you can get away with it, even if there is no institutional structure. And that's what revolutionaries try to do. They try to create a system of facts where the facts exist as represented, but only because they get people to accept those representations. OK, let's go. Oh, yes, you had a question. Yes, okay. Now the question is, how do revolutions uh, work? I, and she said, but uh, you know, when they the, uh, the declaration of the revolutionary only works if you can get enough power, and that's right. The question is, how do you get the power? And typically you get it by getting people to accept it. Uh, you see, the Bolshevik revolution was very interesting in this respect. Uh, they, it was important to them 
that they described the events of October as the October Revolution. It was no revolution. It was an absolutely textbook case of a coup d'etat. They just grabbed power, and you find this in any standard uh, history of the Russian Revolution. Uh, the events of October, well, for example, there's a book by Pipes, uh, but that's not the only one. There are others by Conquest, and I read the stuff by Martin Malia of this university. Malia, Conquest, and Pipes all describe the events in a way that makes it clear that it was not a genuine revolution. It's hard for us today to appreciate the mystique that the word revolution had. So it was very important to Lenin and his colleagues that they describe those events as a revolution. Uh, and they got away with it. Uh, now it's true, they had to have a civil war and all sorts of other things uh, to get away with it. So you, you get an admixture between sheer brute physical power and institutional reality. But the important thing is it only works if you can get people to accept it. Now both the Bolsheviks and the fascists, and particularly the Nazis, were desperately insecure about that acceptance. Hitler and Stalin seemed to be the most powerful people in the world, but they were very insecure, uh, and uh, uh, Stalin was constantly uh, ha purging uh, his colleagues uh, out of fear of disloyalty. And uh, uh, Hitler, though he had enormous power, was constantly in, fe in fear that there would be some kind of revolt or some sort of uprising that would overthrow him. And in fact, there was a revolt in July 20th of 1944. It didn't work, but anyways, there was a, an attempt to assassinate him. Okay, so all of these are uh, uh, things that go beyond the topic of this lecture, but I want you to see that one of the crucial forms of the Speech Act, but it's often not explicit, is where you create a reality. You say, well, uh, let Sally be the chairman. Okay, from now on, Sally, you be the chairman. And there may, there may not even be a vote. People just treat Sally as the chairman. That's a declaration. You have made Sally the chairman by representing her as being chairman. All right, now I want to show you some uh, special features of these. If you take this structure here, if you take the structure FP, uh, then there are all sorts of logical operations that you can perform on the F. Uh, you can have a conditional on the F. So we think of conditionals like if it rains, the ground will be wet. And that's where you have assert if P then Q. But if I say something like, well, if you really want to know, and then I follow that with an assertion. Suppose I say, well, if you really want to know, or if you insist on knowing, Sally's pregnant. Uh, that's of the form uh, if P, then F Q. Uh, that is, the whole illocutionary force is a conditional. It's a conditional assertion. On the condition that you really want to know, I'm telling you that Sally's pregnant. You see that? The condition. Sally's. Uh, uh, a biological state is not dependent on your epistemic desire, desire to know. Whether or not she's pregnant doesn't depend on your desire. What depends on your desire is my telling you. If you really want to, this is of the form, if you really want to know, then I'll tell you that Sally is pregnant. That's a form of if, P, then Q. So you have operations on the F. You can do the logical operations on the F just as you can do logical operations on what's inside. And you have all sorts of modifiers. I strongly assert, or I uh, sincerely ask you, and those are cases where you modify the F. So the F needn't be innocent. Now what sorts of F are there? What sorts of things can mark elocutionary force? Well, in English, uh, the standard things are word order and mood of the verb. Um, uh, such things as the difference between uh, leave the room, will you leave the room, and you will leave the room, where the word order and the mood of the verb marks the different illocutionary force. Tone of voice and emphasis, intonation contour, those can also mark illocutionary force. You will leave the room implicitly or else. That's a directive, and it's marked as a directive by the tone of voice, by the intonation, contour, and the, there's a, what linguists call a morpheme of stress. You stress certain things uh, as a marker of illocutionary force. 
Uh, and in uh, written language, you get punctuation, uh, question marks, exclamation points, and so on. And then, of course, you get the whole range of performative verbs. Now, it's interesting to see um, how rich languages are in their performative verbs. Um, I have this friend, Dan Everett, who investigates uh, an, a language in the Amazon basin, uh, the Pitaha, and he says uh, they have uh, maybe one performative verb, which is roughly say or state. Uh, and I had a friend who was investigating in Africa, and she said her tribe had no performative verbs. In fact, they didn't have a very rich language at all. They had no imperative mood. The only way they gave commands was with a subjunctive. Uh, would that you left the room would be the closest that they would get to an uh, uh, imperative mood. So languages differ in the resources that they have for marking differences of illocutionary point and illocutionary force. I, I always thought English would be pretty rich because of uh, the fact that we've got these two sources of English words. We have both the Romance source when the French uh, uh, conquered England in 1066, uh, but before that you have the old Anglo-Saxon Germanic roots. And the result is that there are certain words in English that, have, that mean pretty much the same thing, but have both a, a Latin and a Germanic root. I think of the word handbook and the word manual. Manual is clearly from the Latin, uh, like mano in Spanish. Uh, and uh, handbook, well, that's German. Handbuch, it's more or less exactly the same. So you do get this oddity, which most languages don't have, where you have words that are more or less exactly synonymous because you have words from two different roots. You have the, uh, the, uh, you have the French root and uh, the uh, Germanic or, or Anglo-Saxon root. And sometimes there will be class differences. So the only people who could afford to eat meat uh, were the people who spoke French and hence the words for the stuff you eat are pork and beef, which is strictly pork et boeuf. I mean, it's exactly the same as the French, whereas the, the stuff on the hoof is a cow and a pig. Does everybody see this point? That, the, that a, a cow means beef uh, and pork means pig, uh, but the people who can afford to eat it uh, spoke French, and hence it acquired a different word for the, for the edible part, pork and beef and veal which veil is vo again, uh, from the stuff on the hoof, which was pig, cow, and calf. In any case, I assumed that we'd have lots more illocutionary verbs, but I did a book on this stuff with Danielle van der Vecken, who's a native French speaker, and what we discovered is the French have more illocutionary verbs than just about anybody. And I think that has to do with their argumentative and legalistic uh, cultural style. Uh, so they have, uh, it turned out we found, uh, uh, they had illocutionary verbs that I, I, I couldn't, I, I would not have predicted. So they, uh, they outran the, uh, the English speakers in a number of speech act verbs. Uh, and that's a book called The Foundations of Illocutionary Logic. It's got one of those catchy titles. Uh, but in any case, um, I, 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 this is a, a subject of investigation, that is how many illocutionary verbs, how many performative verbs do you get, how many illocutionary verbs do you get in different languages. Okay, uh, well I, I think I'm kind of through with um, uh, the taxonomy, but I want you to see the complexity of it, and particularly I want you to see these variations where you can, there's a dis distinction between the assertion of a negative where you have assert not p and the denegation of the assertion where you have don't assert p. So this would be uh, there aren't any horses in the barn and this would be I don't say there are horses in the barn. You see here you're negating the illocutionary force. This is of the form I don't say that just as uh, this is of the form, I say this if you want to know, and then I give a condition on it. So you get the variations uh, and the operations on this uh, the same as you get on the inside the propositional content. Okay, now we get to the tougher question. Why the hell should it be like that? I mean, uh, it, 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 it can't just, this can't be an accident. It doesn't just turn out this way. Uh, uh, the way that the subjunctive 
is dying in all languages. Let us all lament the passing of the subjunctive. Far be it from me to lament the subjunctive. Uh, but in any case, I, it isn't just an accidental fact that we have this. It must derive from the nature of meaning. And now we have to ask the next question, what the hell is meaning? And I'm going to start with Paul Rice. Did I leave myself enough time to even get started? How much time have I got? I got a couple minutes. Okay, let's go. Now, Grice was struck by two things that seem to me to be right. One is, speaker meaning is, in some sense we need to explain, prior to sentence meaning, because that's what sentences are for. Sentences are to talk with. And so if we're going to understand sentence meaning, we have to see it as the meaning that is a potential for a speech act. Uh, the meaning of a sentence is its meaning as a potential speech act. Uh, the other thing that Grice saw was you need, in English, you need a distinction between two senses of meaning. There's a sense of meaning that Grice called natural meaning. If I say those clouds mean rain, or the fall uh, of the a dollar means that the Federal Reserve will raise the interest rates. I, those are cases where you get a correlation, and Grice calls that uh, natural meaning. But then he says there is a special sense of meaning that he calls meaning NN, meaning non-natural, uh, where when I raised my hand, that meant that you were supposed to leave the room. Or when I waved my hand, that meant goodbye. What is this meaning? in the sense which is not a correlation, but has to do with the intentions of the speaker, and that is speaker meaning. Now, Grice gave a neat analysis of that. It doesn't quite work, but it's certainly a basis for discussion. The analysis is this. What's the difference between saying something and meaning it, and saying it without meaning it? I say something just to practice pronunciation. I say over and over, il pleut, il pleut, il pleut. I don't mean anything. I'm just practicing pronunciation. But then I go outdoors, and I'm with uh, Pierre and Henriette, and I say, Pierre et Henriette, il pleut, because it's pouring rain. Now, what's the difference between saying il pleut and meaning it and saying it without meaning it? Grice had an ingenious idea. Here it is. When you say it and mean it, you intend to produce an effect on the hearer, but you intend to produce the effect by a very peculiar method. You intend to produce the effect by getting the hearer to recognize your intention to produce the effect. It's meaning, I'll say that again. In the case of saying P and meaning P, you intend to produce an effect on the hearer, in this case, believing that P, by getting the hearer to recognize your intention to produce that effect. Now that seems promising because there's a remarkable fact about language which isn't true of other forms of human activity. You can achieve your aim just by getting your hearer to recognize your intention to achieve that aim. See, if I want to get rich or marry a Republican or become president of the United States, I don't succeed just by getting people to recognize that, that I want to get rich or marry a Republican or become president. But if I want to tell you that it's raining, then I will succeed it, A, as soon as you recognize that I'm trying to tell you something, and B, what it is that I'm trying to tell you. That is, you don't reason as follows. Well, this guy wants to tell me something. Oh, he wants to tell me that it's raining. Well. I wonder when he's going to do it. He's done it, you see. If, he, if you recognize both that he's trying to tell you something and what it is that he's trying to tell you, he has succeeded in communicating. Okay, it's a beautiful story, but it doesn't quite work for reasons I'll tell you on Thursday.